Welcome to the Precious Testimonies broadcast. I'm Norm Rasmussen, your host. In the Old Testament book of Psalm, chapter 96, verse 3, it reads, Declare God's glory among the nations. Well, Precious Testimonies has been called of God to do just that. And we're to do that by giving born-again Christians an opportunity to share what Jesus has done in their lives to the glory of God the Father and, of course, the Holy Spirit and, of course, Jesus himself. And so with that, we're going to let you hear some people sharing how uh, God has worked in their lives and what this Jesus has done for them and what he means to them. And I pray that this will be something God uses to either help you come to uh, a precious relationship with God or grow in your relationship with God. And with that now, let's listen to what uh, some folks have to say about this great and mighty Savior whose name is Jesus Christ. One of the things although I was raised in the church, that I didn't realize was that as a man or a woman thinks in his heart, so he is or so she is. And so as a young girl going to the movies, now you've got to remember, I'm not a young girl anymore, I'm 75. But going back to the movies, there were restraints on what could be shown. But I had a great imagination so in my mind, I could take things farther than they went. I would get that hint of suggestion, you know, of something that was going to happen, this romance, this, this um, you know, this encounter. Uh, my granddaddy uh, got Detective Magazine. And in Detective Magazine, they would show, you know, these sketches of these gals and their hands would be over their heads and they'd be tied, you know. And it was just very, very sexual. All these things were going into my heart. They were going into my mind. And uh, Jesus would later say, you know, it's what's in the mind, adultery, uh, immorality, homosexuality, lesbianism, begins in the mind, in the heart. And uh, so I developed a very strong sensual focus. And yet my daddy taught me, men don't marry bad girls. They only date them. And because my mother and dad had such an awesome, awesome marriage, I wanted a marriage like that. I wanted, I saw them enjoy one another. I saw them, uh, mother uh, leave the kitchen, dry her hands on her apron, and, and she and daddy would dance around the living room, you know, to the music on the radio. And I heard them say, I love you, I love you. And I saw them kiss and be affectionate. And, uh, and I wanted to be part, uh, part of that. So there was a, a pull toward, you know, I want to be married. Uh, I'm going to be a good girl. I'm going to be a virgin when I walk down the aisle. And so technically, when I got married at the age of 20, I was a virgin. But I'll never forget the first time I let one of my standards slip. And this was when I was in, uh, in nurses training. And I went out with this guy, and, and his hand touched my breast. And it felt so good and that, and uh, that it awakened something in me. And of course, I wanted more. So in my dating, it was always stop and don't go any further, because you're going to be a virgin when you walk down the aisle. But when you looked at me and you looked at the way I dressed, I dressed to show off my body. You know, I when I went to buy a bathing suit, I took a tape measure. <laughs> and I wanted something that give me the smallest waistline and the biggest bust line. And, and so, in a sense, you know, my sexuality was something that 
in a sense that I flaunted. Um, uh, I remember as a as a young girl, this is terrible, but just going around the house doing all these exercises because all my friends were wearing bras and I wasn't. And and we had gym outfits, and you could see my little pink T-shirt underneath it, and and that. And I just, you know, it was that strong sensual focus in my life. There was like this dichotomy this desire to be uh, attractive sexually attractive this restraint to be a virgin but when I walked the aisle I was a virgin I had accomplished my goal but what I didn't realize was that the things the thoughts permitting my mind to to focus on sensual things that that would lead me in that way. As a man or woman thinks in his heart, so he is. Our marriage lasted for six years. My husband was manic depressive, bipolar. Uh, we ended up um, uh, getting a divorce. Um, I went for counseling uh, to two uh, different ministers. And uh, my husband had gone to seminary, and uh, although he was an engineer, he had gone to seminary. And we went for counseling, and neither one of those ministers opened up the Bible. Neither one of them explained to me what marriage was all about. But one of them, one of them, when I finished talking to him, came up to me, and we were in his office, uh, which was in his home, and he came up to me and he put his arms around me and he kissed me on the neck and whispered in my ear, you sure are a good looking gal, Kay. And all of a sudden there arose in me just a, a desire, you know, for this man. And here is a man that I've gone to for counseling. Here is a man that when I have talked to him uh, about, uh, he asked me questions about our, our sexual behavior, you know, our sexual life. And I didn't realize that in that process, he was teaching me things that I didn't know. Um, I um, left my husband. Uh, I shook my fist in the face of God. And I said, to hell with you, God. I'm going to find someone to love me. I wanted to be loved whether I was pretty or ugly, whether I was sick or well, whether I was in a good mood or a bad mood. I wanted someone that would look at me and say, you know what, I love you unconditionally. And I think so many times that we equate love and sex together. And uh, so I moved back. Uh, when I shook my fist in the face of God, and I just want to say this, little did I realize that when I said, to hell with you, God, that that's exactly what Jesus Christ did. That Jesus Christ took my hell. He took the wages of my sin. He took the penalty of my sin. And Jesus, who knew no sin, was going to be made sin for me. He was going to be made an immoral woman for me. He was made a homosexual, he was made a lesbian, he was made a thief, he was made, he who knew no sin was made to be sin for us so that we might have his righteousness. So when I said to hell with you, God, I didn't even know that before the foundation of the world, according to Ephesians chapter one, verse three and four and five, that God had said, to heaven with you, Kay, and that God had a plan. Your passion beats for Christ alone. I moved back to this area and where my husband had gone to school. It was the Washington, D.C. Uh, area, Alexander, Arlington, Virginia. And um, I got in touch with the minister. And uh, I ended up, well, before when I went to look for a place, I ended up staying at his house. And I ended up doing everything short of the actual act of intercourse. So really, for the first time in my life, what I had thought, the romance, the intrigue, the sex that goes, that goes with it, was actually acted out and here I was with a married man, 
and and doing everything short. Uh, you know, the Bible says if you look at a woman to commit adultery with her in your heart, then you're guilty of adultery. It's only happened in the heart. It's open only happened in the mind. And in the Jewish thinking, the heart and the mind are the same thing. And that's why he says, as a person thinks in his heart, in his mind, so he is. And so, uh, although I did not actually have the act of sexual intercourse with that man, I was guilty of committing adultery. And this is what people don't realize today, and, and I don't mean to be too graphic, but the thing is with oral sex, people are saying, but it's not sex. I mean, President Clinton said, I did not have sex with that woman. He did have sex with that woman. And what we have to understand is that God looks at it. Where does it begin? It begins in the heart and in the mind. The heart, the mind, that's the key. That's the absolute key to sexual purity. And, and, and learning how to control that, learning how to control the thoughts. I've written a book called Lord is at Warfare, Teach Me to Stand. And in that book, I tell about what happened to me after I became a Christian and how I, I was set free from the power of sin. I, I felt absolutely clean. I felt like a virgin on the day that I got saved. And yet I, I, I continued to have a battle uh, with my mind. And I would start remembering things that I did before I was saved. Because you see, after that, um, that little tryst with that minister, uh, then I, I made a policy. I will never date a married man. I didn't intend to get in bed with men, but I would find myself, you know, the Bible says that we have sunk down in a pit that we have dug with our own hands. And so what was happening was you, you say no and uh, no, and then one day you say yes to sin. And we forget that sin will cost you more than you ever intended to pay. It will take you farther than you ever expected to stray, and it will cost you far more than you ever expected to pay. Because sin is addictive. The Bible says whosoever commits sin becomes the slave of sin. I went from one man to another man looking for someone to love me. I had a religion, but I didn't have a relationship. I knew about God. You know, I knew a little bit about the Word of God. I knew that God hated divorce. I knew that uh, adultery was a sin. I knew the Ten Commandments. But as I said, I had a religion but not a relationship. So what happened is I went from one man to another man, and each time I went with those men, I would find myself doing things that I knew were wrong. I had two little boys. Um, I uh, eventually met a man in Washington, D.C. Uh, I didn't know that he was married. Uh, he asked me out. Uh, I really fell in love with Jim, really fell in love with Jim. And then I found out that Jim was married. But the problem was I loved Jim. Now, I was sleeping with Jim. And uh, I, I was sleeping with him, and then I found out he was married, and then I found out his wife was pregnant with her sixth child. And, uh, and eventually, after two years of this affair, and, and I, and I want to say something, and, and I share it because I want people to understand that, um, I, I, I want them to understand that sin is never isolated. It affects others. One day, my son came down the stairs, my oldest son, and saw me on the living room floor with a man. And I didn't know it. And I would never have him see that. But that would have an impact on him later. Later, I would find myself, after I became a Christian, saying to him, I don't know 
if you ever saw him mate with another man. And I remember that teenage boy sitting there and nodding his head. And I said, I want you to know, if I had known the Word of God, if I had known Jesus, I never would have divorced your father. And I'm asking you to forgive me. And I'm asking you to forgive me for what I did and what you saw for being immoral, you know. And I knew God had forgiven me, but it had his impact on him. And we have to understand that sin is never isolated. We say, oh, it's just between the two of us. It's not just between the two of us. And it affects, it's ruining our society. But let me go back. I had this affair with this married man for two years. And then at the end of those two years, I began to feel guilty. And I thought, I've got to stop this. So I love that man dearly. I loved, I had never loved any man like I loved Jim. And, but I broke off the affair. And, and I decided I was going to be good. But there's a verse that says the good that I wanted to do, I couldn't do. And the evil that I didn't want to do, I did. And then he cries out, oh, wretched man that I am. Who's going to deliver me from this body of death? Because it is a body of death. The Bible says in John 8, whosoever commits sin, and it's like chains around you, whosoever commits sin becomes the slave of sin. But if the Son shall set you free, you shall be free indeed. Your passion that beats for Christ alone. Your passion. On July 16th, 1963, I went to a party on July the 15th. I went to a party and Christians were there. And, and in fact, they were all Christians and I had run into them and, and these were people from uh, my religious days. I met one and, and he was walking with the Lord and everything. But anyway, I went to this party and someone looked at me and said, why don't you quit telling God what you want and tell him that Jesus Christ is all you need? And I thought, you are so rude to talk like that at a party. Jesus Christ is not all I need. I threw my mink over my shoulder, walked out the house. The next morning I got up, it was a Friday, and I thought, I'm sick. I'm sick and there's no cure for my sickness. And I think, honestly, that that's the way so many people feel that are caught, especially in sexual sin. Because deep in your heart, if you're a man sleeping with a man, deep in your heart, you know that this is not normal. You can't have sex the normal way that you have with a woman. Deep in your heart, if you're sleeping with someone else's mate, you know, you know deep in your heart, this is not right. Uh, if you're a woman with another woman, you know deep in your heart, it may be meeting a need or that, but deep in your heart, you know, hey, this is not normal. You have to do it some other way to get your kicks because God designed a man and a woman to fit together. Anatomically, he designed it. That's why every sin that a person does is without his body. But those that commit immorality sin against their own body. Shall I take the members of harlot? Shall I take the members of Christ and join them with the members of a harlot? He says, don't you know the two are one flesh? It's the act of sexual intercourse. And the way that God designed a man and a woman that makes them one flesh. So I think that, that, that there is this knowledge deep, deep, deep buried within and, and, and that it's, that there's something missing, that there's something wrong. And, um, and so that morning when I got up, I, I worked at Johns Hopkins on a research team. I'm a nurse and I called Dr. Cheek from Australia and I said, I mean, he's an Australian living in Baltimore. And I said, I can't come to work, I'm sick. And I thought, I have a sickness that no man can cure. And that is true. And, uh, and, and I thought, there's just no cure. You can't do an operation. You can't take a pill for this. There's no, there's no cure. And that morning, I decided I would take my boys camping. 
these Christians were going camping. So I'm in the kitchen baking a cake, and, and my oldest son is at day camp, and my younger son's hanging on to me, so hungry for a mother's love. I think that people that are caught up in immorality get so caught up in their own needs that they fail to be the parent that they should be. And the thing that if I had known, you know, I would have handled this, this marriage to my husband that was manic, depressive, bipolar so differently and handled the divorce differently and, 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 and not been so centered on me. I felt like I had to have a man that loved me unconditionally. Well, all of a sudden I turned around on July 16th, I bent down, I looked at Mark, and I said, Mark, honey, mommy's got to be by herself. Will you let me be alone for just a minute? And I want you to know that I wanted to be a wonderful mother. But sin takes you farther than you ever wanted to go. And, uh, and I ran upstairs and I fell down beside the bed and I said, God, I don't care what you do to me. I don't care if I never see another man as long as I live. I don't care if you, par if you paralyze me from my neck down. I don't care what you do to my two boys if you'll just give me peace. And there on my knees that day, he gave me the Prince of Peace, the Lord Jesus Christ. And God says, come now, come now. Let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, yet shall you be as white as snow. And later on, I would find a verse. And it's a quote from Hosea. It's written in Romans. And it says this, And he called her beloved when there was nothing lovely about her. I came to God as this immoral woman on my knees. I said, you can have me. You can do anything you want with me. If you'll give me peace, he gave me the Prince of Peace, the Lord Jesus Christ, and wonder of wonders. When I stood up, I knew that I was new. I, I felt like a virgin. And I mean, I, I, I just knew that wherever I went, that Jesus Christ was going with me. It's the wonder, the miracle of redemption. And I love the word redemption because redemption carries the idea in, in biblical times of going to a slave market, seeing someone in the slave market for sale, paying the price for them, bringing them off the slave block, unshackling them and setting them free and that's what salvation is whosoever commits sin becomes a slave of sin jesus walks into the slave market he says i'll buy that person so the enemy comes in and he says you don't know the cost and he says yes i do he says you don't want to pay the cost it'll cost you your life but he buys us and when he buys us he sets us free he sets us free. He brings us off the slave block. He takes those chains of sin and he breaks the power of sin. And he sets us free to be what we should be. I was saved that day. I knew, I just knew that I could no longer dress the way I dressed. I knew that I couldn't show off my body anymore. I, I, I knew that, 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 that wherever he went, he was going, wherever I went, he was going with me. No one taught me. No one opened the scriptures. No one was there except me and God. But this is the miracle of redemption, of transformation. Uh, I, I uh, started reading the Bible. Somebody brought me a Phillips translation of the New Testament, and, and I would prop it on the steering wheel as I drove to work, and I would read it. And I came across the verse, if any man or woman be in Christ, he or she is a new creation, all things have passed away. All things have become new. And I thought, God, you had to put that in the Bible to describe me. 
And, 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 and then I discovered uh, Romans chapter 5, when we were sinners, when we were helpless. I was helpless. I couldn't help myself. I couldn't stop sinning. Because sin is 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 a it's a slavery that you get into, and and uh, so when you were sinners, when you were helpless, when you were without hope, when you were ungodly, when you were an enemy of God, He saved you. That to me is the awesome thing. And so the the message. And can I fast forward just? really fast forward and 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 go all the way to the fact that God brought me to the point where I told him I'd go back to my husband and my husband committed suicide that left me as a widow with two boys then I prayed and said God if you want me to have a husband bring him to me and and people can listen to my testimony later but and and God brought me Jack uh, we end up on the mission field and on the mission field, I'm pregnant with David, uh, our third child. I'm teaching teenagers, and I'm teaching them what I needed to know. I'm teaching them what I did not hear, that I did not hear as a man thinks in his heart. I'm teaching them the Word of God. I'm teaching them about a holy God, a righteous God, a just God. I'm teaching them about the wages of sin, which is death. I'm teaching them all these things. I'm teaching them about sexual purity. I'm teaching them how to control their thoughts. I'm teaching them, hey, you don't touch a woman. It is written. It is good for a man not to touch a woman. Don't like that fire. Keep your hands to yourself. You know, keep yourself pure. And and so I'm teaching them all these things. And one day I'm sitting there in, in the nursery and, and uh, in the bedroom and nursing David. And all of a sudden, I, I'm so sad. And I'm thinking, I'm married twice. And I've battled immoral thoughts. And... Uh, immoral dreams and uh, my boys have had two daddies God where were you when I was a teenager why didn't you send somebody like you've sent me to teach these teenagers and God spoke to my heart and he said this he said I saved you when I wanted to save and if you'll quit moaning and groaning about your past and you'll share it, I'll use it. And later on, I came across a verse in Galatians 1. Paul's giving us testimony. Paul calls himself the chief of sinners. He says it is a trustworthy statement that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am foremost. And so Paul says in Galatians chapter 1, when it pleased God to reveal his son in me. And I thought, God, there it is. The proof that what I heard in my heart and my mind was truly measurable as truth by the word of God. You saved me when you wanted to save me. You're the Redeemer. You say all things keep on working together for good to those that love God, to those that are the called according to his purpose, for whom God foreknew. When did God call me? When did God know I was going to be saved? Ephesians 1. He chose me in Christ before the foundation of the world. When did I get saved? I didn't get saved until I was 29. But God saved me then. Because, and if he saved me then, and he knew I was going to get saved, then all things, even my wretched, horrible past, God will use to minister to others. And when I saw that, when I saw that my sexual brokenness, that my sexual sin, that, that, that all that I did and got involved in was, was, was redeemable by God then, in a sense, I was set free. And I have people come up to me all the time and say, I always thought 
that I'd have to sit on the back row of the church, that God would never use me like he's used you. And now I know God can use anybody. He's the Redeemer. Pure passion that beats for Christ alone. When you know that your sins are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, and you know that, and you know, hey, there's no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. As Paul wrote, it is a trustworthy statement, worthy of all acceptance that Christ came into the world to save sinners. He saves sinners, but he breaks the power of sin. Salvation is not only getting forgiveness of sins so that you don't pay the penalty of sin, but it is the breaking of the power of sin. And someday, freedom from the presence of sin because we will dwell in the new Jerusalem forever and ever and ever. God will wipe away all of our tears. Nothing unclean will ever come into it. And we will be there. We who were unclean, who have been made clean by a holy God so that we could be a holy people. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10, By the grace of God, I am what I am. Grace is unmerited favor. It's something that you can't earn, never pay for. And he says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. His grace was not poured out on me in vain. That lavish, extravagant grace of God was not poured out on me in vain. But I labored more than them all, speaking of other apostles. Yet not I, but the grace of God in me. People will often say to me, it must be hard for you to share yourself, to be so vulnerable. It really isn't. Because I really, really know God. And I know God because I've studied the Word of God. You meet God in the Old Testament. That's where you're introduced to, the, to this righteous, holy, long-suffering, compassionate God. Yes, a God of justice. Yes, a God of righteousness. But a God whose mercies are new every morning, whose compassions fail not. And once you go to him, and if you're all right with God, you're all right with others. I mean, in Romans 8, he says, if God's for us, who can be against us? Would it be Jesus? Oh, no. He died for me. When did he die for me? He died for me when I was a sinner. You know, I love Jeremiah. Jeremiah is bringing the message, and it's a message for today, to a nation that is so corrupt, and God is going to have to judge them. And yet what he keeps saying is, you've forsaken me. Return. 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 Jeremiah cries out, Heal me, O Lord, and I will be healed. Save me, O God, and I will be saved. And Jeremiah looks at these broken people and he says, for the brokenness of the daughter of my people, I mourn. Dismay has taken over me. He says, is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no great physician there? What he's saying is, yes, there is a balm in Gilead. There is a healing balm. It's the word of God. Psalm 107 verse 20 says, he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from all their destructions. Is there no Baal Gilead? Is there no great physician there? God's name is Jehovah Rapha. He is the Lord God that heals. May I talk to you for just a moment, woman to woman or woman to man. We live in a society where over one-third of all women have been sexually abused. They've been used for the deviant pleasure of other men. 
just for their sexual gratification. They've had to do terrible things. They've been asked to do terrible things. And yet, because our body is our body, that even though sometimes it's terrible, there is a pleasure in it. And so then on top of that, you begin to feel a guilt. I remember a gal when I was teaching. I have written a book called Lord Heal My Hurts. And I was teaching this at a conference. And afterwards, this girl came barreling down the aisle. Her hair was greasy. Her clothes were uh, unkept. She was very, very heavy. And she looked at me and she said, I can not forgive. I will not forgive. And I said, oh, honey, come and tell me what happened. And then she told me about her father and how he sexually abused her and how she got pregnant and he got her the baby aborted and he did it once, he did it twice. The third time they had a baby and it was deformed. And the baby died. And she said, I am so hurt. I said, you know what? I am so angry at your father. She looked at me. She said, what did you say? I said, I am so angry at your father. And I want you to know, God is angry. The Bible talks about God being angry far more than he talks about man being angry. Sin angers God. Sin that is done to you or sin that you commit angers God. And yet he is the Redeemer. You say, if God was God, then why didn't he rescue me? You know what, precious one? I don't know. I don't know. But I know this. He's rescuing you right now. He's telling you that because he is God, he can take that wretched past and he can make it work together for good. He's telling you that you can have a brand new beginning. He's telling you that you can start with Jesus Christ. Coming to him and saying to him, I'm unclean. I'm a sinner. I've walked my way. I was abused. I abused. I was misused. I turned to another woman because of what men had done to me. Whichever sex you are, God looks at you and he says, I'm the redeemer. This is a trustworthy statement. I've come to save you. And I promise you now that if you'll come to me and you'll believe that Jesus died for your sins and you'll receive him I'll be your Lord I'll be your God and my father will be your father and I'll forgive all your sins and I'll make you a brand new creature if you'll get into my word I'll heal you it's the balm of Gilead and I'll heal you and I will restore you. And you know what? I will use you. I'll use you to help others. Your pain and your suffering and your sin and your wretchedness and your even deviancy will not be wasted. I'll redeem it if you'll just come to me. That girl that came barreling down that aisle talked to me. I explained to her that God would deal with her father because, I mean, she was put in an institution and everything. I mean, he called her a slut. He called her a whore. I mean, he called her everything. He accused her. And I said, but if you'll let go of that bitterness, if you'll forgive him, I promise you, God will heal you. God healed her. A year or so later, I looked down. I was teaching 
That's at Precept Ministries International in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We've purposely kept our auditorium small so that we can have one-on-one. -on -one. And I thought, I know that girl. I think I know that girl. So we got down close enough to see her name tag, and I nearly died. No more stringy, greasy hair. No more dirty clothes. No more, in a sense, gloppy fat. This was a woman that was absolutely transformed. I put my arms around her, just cuddled her close, and she told me the story of how God healed her brokenness, of how she got into the Word of God, how she grew, and now how she was married. And oh, what a marriage God has given her. He absolutely adores her. Now, before she met that man, she met another man. She wrote me about him. And uh, she said, should I tell him? And I said, yes, honey, I think you should tell him about your past because it can affect your relationship in, in the bedroom until you get used to one another. She told him, and he looked at her, and he says, I don't want someone that's been used by you. And he walked away. And I said, I'm so glad you told him. He really didn't love you. I want you to know, precious one, that there is a man that will never walk away from you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you so that you can boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do to me. He loves you with an everlasting love. And listen carefully, with loving kindness, he's drawn you to himself when it pleases him. So what do you do with the past? Well, that's a whole nother story. But what you do with the past is summarized in Philippians chapter 3, forgetting those things that are behind. I press forward towards the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. Listen to me. Don't let your past cripple you. You can't change it. You can't do anything about it. But your Redeemer says He will redeem it and use it. So He's going to use you and use even that pain, even that suffering, to make you more like Jesus and to give you a very fruitful and purposeful life. He causes all things to keep on working together for good. He does not say they're good, but He causes them to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew, that's you, he predestined, he marked out beforehand for you to become conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. You know what? Jesus learned obedience through the things which he suffered. So he's touched with the feeling of your sufferings, of your infirmities. But he'll heal them and he'll use them. All you have to do is say, God, I want you to be my Father. I want Jesus to be my Savior. And I want the Holy Spirit to live inside of me and let my body be his temple. And then, God, I want everything in this temple to say holy to you. Holy means you're no longer common. You're set aside for a divine purpose, God's purpose. A couple great stories. One, uh, there was a Jewish rabbi who was a uh, very, very highly respected rabbi. From the, from the story I picked up, he was like the most respected of the Jewish rabbis. I think he died at like 107 years old crazy way up there and he just died a few, couple years ago anyway he um, when he died he uh, he left a letter and he said this letter is not to be read till one year after my death death or burial one of the two and um, so he died just a few years ago so this was open sometime of recent and uh, when they opened the letter it said Jesus Christ is the Messiah <laughs> Is that awesome? <laughs> Maybe you didn't hear me. 
This leading rabbi declared to all the other rabbis, Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Right. Right. <laughs> is that outrageous or what? I, there, were, there are at least 70 now Jewish rabbis in New York that are born again. They have received Christ as the Messiah. And there's a tremendous movement that is real underground and secret and hidden, but in Israel. And there are many that are waiting for the right time to come forth. But, uh, you know, this whole notion that things just get worse and worse, it's true on one level. I mean, on a, on a world's level, on a gover uh, man's government level, it gets worse and worse. But in the kingdom, it just gets better and better. And uh, to hear these stories, uh, one of the... Uh, uh, the leader of the Hamas, here's a second story, the leader of the Hamas, his, uh, his son got born again. And, uh, and he, has, he has declared openly his faith in Christ, saying, I know it may cost me my life, but he's uh, living, I think, in the Bay Area. And, uh, but he is uh, just a strong uh, preacher of the gospel. So that's so, so encouraging, so fun to hear those stories. Yeah, yeah you guys, for that. One of the cool things is he went to a, a, a church in New Zealand that is related to a church that we partner with here in uh, California. It's down in Mammoth Lakes. And it's a, it's a church, an unusual church, in that it, it, it is a church focused on ministering to skiers and snowboarders. And they, they plant churches in those in Mammoth Lakes, uh, California, this particular city in uh, New Zealand and in Switzerland. And that's, there's a community of people. They travel all over the world just to ski. That's what they do. And those folks are there to bring the gospel to them. And uh, the thing that's so encouraging to me is the Lord, the kingdoms of this world are in fact becoming the kingdom of our Lord in Christ. Every area of society is getting permeated and rocked by people that just are allowing God to sprinkle them into these, uh, in these realms of service. So I'm so encouraged by it. And they just tore it up down there. And uh, in fact, Kelly Clark, who uh, uh, Kelly Clark is an um, Olympic gold medalist from the Mammoth Lakes Church, was down there. And uh, both her and another Olympic gold medalist um, had uh, career threatening injuries. And they came here, and Jesus healed them both. And uh, so they are out there doing what they do. That's amazing. Amazing, amazing. Eric got back not too long ago from, uh, uh, from Kenya. He's doing a class right now. But uh, he, when he was in Kenya, he laid hands on, he got to pray over the guy who ended up winning the gold medal in the, in the marathon, the Kenyan. And this guy, he laid hands on him and prayed over him. And it so rocked him. He went away. He, he beat the, the Olympic gold uh, record by uh, three minutes. And, uh, he, and he won the gold medal, and he came home to Kenya and got saved. He wasn't born again yet. But the Lord just impacted him with that encounter. He went and, you know, I can't figure out why people run so far. You know, if they're not throwing a ball, I don't want to run. It's just like, you just got to keep throwing the ball to get, keep me running. Otherwise, you know, you got to draw a line somewhere. These people are just run. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I got a report this week. I was, in, I was in Wales here a few weeks ago. And... Um, a gentleman was brought to me that was very, very uh, sick. You can tell when somebody's had a disease for a long time because they're just their whole ability to maneuver and walk and countenance and all that color, everything. Anyway, they brought, he was uh, in uh, he had a kidney that had to be removed because of cancer, and so we laid hands on him and prayed. And he's gone back to the doc doctor, has the report. There is no cancer left. It disappeared. They took a biopsy, and the cancer is gone. So uh, I'm just really, really encouraged about that. There's a testimony. Um, how many of you remember last week we had the testimony where everyone got saved in the juvenile hall? Everyone in that group. Four, Fourteen, was it? Fourteen people? Well, they took that testimony into a drug rehab home this week and shared it. And they ended up, uh, an atheist got born again. Another atheist backslid. That's good. <laughs> Another atheist got born again. They ended up baptizing. There was recommitments to the Lord. They ended up baptizing 10 adults and 5 children. <laughs> baptized in a bathtub. Come on. 
I heard another story I've got to get more details on. Um, but uh, in fact, if you're the one that told me the story, please bring me uh, more of the information if you can. But there was a gentleman walking back and forth in front of a Muslim mosque. And, uh, and he was, uh, uh, needed a miracle in his body and he'd asked them for healing and they couldn't do it. So he just walked back and forth and they wanted him to go away because, you know, it, it wasn't a good, he was, he was lame and not capable of functioning normally. And, and so he just walked back and forth, back and forth. And someone who believes God saw him, went to him and prayed and God healed him. He got born again. And, uh, and there's been this domino effect that's taken place because of this guy's conversion. So it's not just amazing. Jesus is in a good mood. And he's, he's wild about you. So, You know, we're going to pray for some folks tonight for healing miracles in people's bodies. I just believe that God's going to touch and heal people right now. There's uh, this uh, anointing for healing of migraines. Um, there was, I, was, I spoke at chapel this week for the Christian school, and, uh, and I, I gave this, uh, it wasn't intended as a word of knowledge, it was, it, to be honest with you, it was an illustration. I was illustrating something, and I used the migraine headache thing. But well, I'll be honest, when I did, I felt a release of power, and I thought, there was something on that. And uh, one of the uh, teacher's aides came to me, and uh, one of the gals comes up to me, and she says, I've been in, in n constant pain, uh, two or three months, I forget. That's, uh, it was uh, some cycle thing in her life, but it was like the last two or three months was just solid, no break from pain whatsoever. And the Lord Jesus healed her right on the spot, so completely healed. And this my name is Arrington Douglas, and today I'm going to give my testimony. Not really that many people know about my testimony and it's because I'm a shy person, I'm a reserved person, and I really don't open up that much. So I just say you know, this is the opportunity to be able to reach everybody who doesn't know me that well and don't know what I came from. And I just felt God telling me I should do this. So that's what I'm gonna do today. <clears throat> As a child, I always went to church, I've always, gone to the church with my mom on Sundays and Bible study on Wednesdays and I went to a lot of church when I was younger and I still go to a church but when I was younger it just felt like we went every day but as a ch I really didn't enjoy going to church my mom made me go and that was, that's probably what made me most rebellious her making me go to church but it's still a good thing that she made me go because sometimes the preacher would really touch me. They would speak about rebellious kids and they'll be, they'll feel like they're talking exactly to me because that week I'll be rebellious to my mom. And I was a rebellious little kid. And when I was four years old, I went to Sunday school for like the first time. My mom let me go to the church I go to now, Athens UPC. It's a great church. I love going there. I still go there now, and it's just a church. I would love to take my kids if I have some Sunday. And that's the church I got the Holy Ghost at the first time. I just ask God to forgive me of my sins. And one of the ladies at the church just told me to say hallelujah and just give praise to God, and I did. I kept doing it and I just got the Holy Ghost for the first time. I know I got it because I saw a white light and my life just changed after that. And that's just a stepping stone in my life that just gave me a closer relationship with God. And when I was a teenager, even though I still had the Holy Ghost, I really stopped enjoying going to church. I stopped liking to listen to the preacher. I would grow cold. I would go to church every Sunday, but I wouldn't listen. I would just go through the motions of a Christian, just go up to the church, and then I'll be like, yes, I'm done for this week. And it's just something that just made me grow cold from God. In high school, I, I grew depressed. I felt like nobody cared about me. 
and I just became more rebellious towards my mom and I just felt lonely. I always sat by myself sometimes, not, but I still have friends that hang, hang out with me. But I just felt lonely still. I felt like there was something missing. And I was, I was just missing God in my life. And I grew addicted to pornography. I used that as an escape from the world to just be able to lust after girls. And I tried to get girls. I wasn't good at that. And it's just, I grew addicted. That's all I thought about. That's all I cared about. That's what made me, that's just what made me have a motive. And I was just addicted. And, I let the music I listened to shape how I thought about things. And it wasn't good holy music, it was music talking about killing people or talking about destroying the world. And it's just something I thought was cool, something to think about sometimes. And I just let the world shape me and let it define who I was. And this was in high school. Now last year, I really, that's when I really wanted to get closer to God. I started watching testimonies of other people and I just seen other people in the same way I was. And I would just say, why don't I feel like this? Why don't I have love for God like these people do? Why isn't my life changed like that? Why, why, is, why don't I have a relationship with God like that? And it's just seeing other people's testimonies, that's what really got me closer to God. I mean, I felt the spirit every time I watched the testimony. I will end up crying, crying for over testimonies of people I don't know. And I just want people, you should, you should give your testimony. Your testimony can save someone's life. I changed my life after I watched this one testimony of this man. It was a video where he talked about, it was in the spoken word format. He talked about how he grew addicted to pornography and he just, he got cold and then he asked God to change his life. That's what really inspired me. I went to my truck and I just cried out, God, I want a relationship with you. I want to have my life with you. I want to love you like these people love you. I want to just change my life. And from that day, that's when I like, I really got on fire for God. I wasn't cold anymore. I felt the cold leave my heart. I felt God just changed my life. I stopped listening to the music I listened to. I stopped watching porn. I stopped thinking the way I thought. I stopped letting the world shape me who I am. I just started reading the Bible and understanding. Like, I can understand the Bible now. I used to read the Bible and just say, what is this? Now I can just read the Bible and just understand it. And one of my New Year's resolution was to grow closer with God. And I can just say, that's not, that shouldn't be a New Year's resolution. That should be a life resolution because we should always want to grow closer to God and we should just let God be the reason why we leave, live. We should wake up in the morning and just thank him for everything he do because that's what we all should do because he's worthy. And I just thank God that he changed my life. I just thank him that he just gives me a reason to live. He gives me a reason to love. He gives me happiness and joy. And I'm just glad that God changed my life, guided me from what I was, because I was on the path to destruction. I was on the path of corruption. I was letting the world shape me. And if I would have died before I cried out to God in my truck, I would have went to hell. Even if I had the Holy Spirit when I was 12 years old, I would have still went to hell, because I was cold in God. I didn't love God as he should. I didn't love him with all my heart. I didn't love my neighbor. I didn't care about anybody else. I was just self-centered, self-righteous. So I just want to say thank you for watching my testimony. Maybe you'll find hope in God. And just pray to Jesus. And just ask Jesus to change your life because he's the only way to heaven. He's the only way you can change your life. I don't care where you came from. Nothing's too hard for Jesus to do. And I just want to bless everybody, everybody who watches this, I want you to be blessed. And I want you to just find hope in Jesus Christ, because he's the only way. He's the only savior. Thank you, and God bless you. Well, unfortunately, young people in, uh, in neighborhoods like this um, aren't taught respect the way they should be. They're taught respect through violence. 
uh, you acquire respect uh, by being physically violent towards other people. The more violent you are, the more respect you have. Mario earned the reputation as a tough street fighter, but his neighborhood was 80% African American. And as a Latino youth, Mario didn't feel like he fit in. He couldn't relate to his parents either. So at age 12, Mario ran away from home. He hung out on street corners and quickly learned the fine arts of robbery and drug use. By age 14, the gangs wanted him to recruit members and sell drugs to those his own age. The gang became Mario's entire life. Everything I thought about, everything I believed revolved around the, around the gang. Broke off communication with my family totally. They had taken on the place of my mother, uh, my father, my brothers, and, uh, and my whole life revolved around them. Then, his family betrayed him. Mario had just pocketed several thousand from a robbery. When I awoke, my money was stolen. And the people that were at the party that were all part of my gang or part of my clique, they had all left. The only one left was a, was a gang leader that had fallen asleep and the owner of the house. I went to check my pockets because they told me the party's over, you know, everybody left. And I seen that I had been robbed. Really saddened me to find out that what I had been taught and everything was not real. Mario withdrew from the gang. By age 20, he'd become a serious drug addict. I was hiding. I was running away from... Uh, from the fact that I had tried to find myself in the gang and I wasn't able to. And, uh, and now I was left with nothing. He tried to fill the void inside with his girlfriend, Maria. But his gloom and anger made her the victim. Mario was possessive, controlling, and abusive. He was so violent and um, he had hit me, you know, more than a few times. He started slapping me and punching me and he threw me out of the car in the middle of like a really busy street. The fear drove Maria to church, and when she started going every night, Mario became insanely jealous. He accused her of having an affair with the pastor, forbidding her to go to church again. He told me, he told me straight up, he goes, if this keeps on, he goes, it's going to get really violent, and I'm going to end up killing you. He told me, if you go, I'm going to go to church, I'm going to kill the pastor, and I'm going to kill you. Maria ignored the threat and left for an all-night prayer meeting. Mario couldn't handle the idea of church on a Friday night. I lost my mind. I went into a, went in a rage. Grabbed the gun, figured I was gonna go in there and just start shooting people. And, uh, but then I thought about it, I said, no, you know, they're always talking about blood and, and, and uh, redemption. And, you know, when I've gone there, I'd heard the message of the cross. I said, I'm just gonna stab this pastor right on the altar and make him my sacrifice, you know? Meanwhile, inside the church, the pastor had a miraculous word of knowledge. Holy Spirit is telling me that through those doors, there's a spirit that wants to enter. We need to bind the spirit that wants to enter here, because that spirit, that spirit is a spirit of murder. He goes, I feel from the Lord that there's a spirit of murder. He said, and um, I'm going to ask all of you to pray. With that, the pastor dispatched prayer warriors to the front door of the church to pray away the spirit. I was praying, and I had not, I noticed at one point some of the brothers um, praying by the door, and they couldn't see outside because it was a, it was a wooden door. There was, no there was no glass, so they couldn't see, and they were praying fervently by the door. I ran out of my car and when I got to the church door in a rage and I tried to open it, I was physically restrained by an unseen force. I felt a, a power that was restraining me from going inside the church and, uh, and I knew that it was something supernatural that was happening to me. Therefore I said, wow, you know, my girlfriend's God is real. She serves a real God. And uh, I just stood there for a few minutes and I couldn't actually open the door of the church. So I uh, walked back to my car and I just sat inside and, and all of a sudden I was calm. Stunned by this powerless feeling, Mario waited in his car for Maria to come out. He didn't realize it was an all-night service. Now all he wanted to do was to talk to her, find out why she was so drawn to this church. He turned on the radio and happened upon a local pastor who sounded like he was talking right to Mario. The pastor said that 
God had a plan and a purpose with my life and that that was the only reason that I was actually still alive, having been put in the dangerous situations that I had been involved in all my life. And uh, it really got me thinking. And then he, he asked another question. He said, why do you hate this pastor? Why do you hate the pastor so much? Why do you hate God? What has God done to you? Just like that. And then um, he said, if anything, he's given you life and he's given it to you more abundantly. And uh, at that point, he said, if you want to pray, it doesn't matter where you're at, just bow your head and say this prayer with me. And I bowed my head and I said that prayer in that car. So right there in his car, Mario gave his life to Jesus Christ. His attitude changed quickly. All of a sudden on the inside, I felt peace. And uh, the only way I could explain what I felt was that I wasn't worried anymore. I didn't feel, uh, before I was always looking over my shoulder. Every single person that I came across, I felt it was like someone that I had done harm to. Until that point, actually in the car, it just began. I, I felt peace. And I knew that if anything happened to me, if, any, if anything happened, that I would go to heaven. I knew that. At the end of the service, Mario was shocked to see Mario at the front door. He was just so serene and so calm that it, I was astonished. I was, what is going on? Mario explained what had happened and promised Maria that he would start living for God. My whole attitude changed. My new desire now was to, uh, was to please God and to serve Him. And uh, the more I started attending church, the more I started learning about Him, and, uh, and eventually wanting to tell others where I had come from. Mario proved that his conversion was real. He married Maria, got a full-time job, and earned his high school diploma. Over the next six years, Mario started his own Hispanic ministry and a special outreach to gang members called the Jesus Disciples. Through Mario's influence, hundreds of hardened gangsters have transformed their lives. In fact, the Miami Herald calls Mario the Pat Robertson of Miami's ganglands. I was a runaway from the age of 12, involved in gang life basically my whole life. And uh, at probably the worst point of my life, when I was down and out, didn't believe in anybody. Uh, Jesus showed me his mercy, came into my heart and totally turned me around. Hey everybody, uh, it's Jessica from The Passion and Devotion and I just wanted to um, really record my testimony. Um, I just feel like it's very important for everybody that watches um, to really hear about um, who we are and where we came from and so that you can have a better look at um, just what God has done in our life and everything. So here's our testimony. So growing up, um, I grew up in um, a household, you know, I had, I had good parents growing up. Um, they, they did not know the Lord. They did not have a relationship with Him. We didn't go to church or anything. Um, in my house, the only recollection that I can remember of God or Jesus um, or anything like spiritual was um, we had this huge Bible that was um, like in the living room and it we never pulled it out to read it or anything like that but I remember whenever we would get in trouble or whenever things would happen my mom would be like we swear on the Bible you know God is watching you that kind of it was that kind of thing and she didn't know because she didn't know God or anything so she was just doing I guess what she knew to do and um you know, it's like I would always hear my whole life, God is watching you. Um, you know, it was always this like fearful, dreadful thing about God. So honestly, I really, I didn't know God. I didn't, I didn't care to know God. I just was kind of living my life. Um, as I, you know, grew up older and became a teenager, I really like got into craziness, like just rebellion, like just hanging out with crazy, like people that were, you know, no good for me. Um, I got into drugs, I drank alcohol, I partied with, with friends, um, and um, I actually worked at Walmart at the time, and um, I remember when, when people would come to my line, there was lots of people that would come to my line and they would pass, like, tracks, and, um, and hand them to me or slip them in, like, oh, no, next to my register or whatever. And I would get so angry. I would be like, who do you think you are? Like, I'm a Christian. Not having any clue, like, what it even meant to be a Christian. But I would get so angry. I would tear up those tracks and I would throw them away um, in the trash can. And, you know, if people would talk to me about the Lord. I would be like, I'm a Christian. And honestly, guys, listen, I really thought being a Christian back then, I was really not 
I'm not smart. I was, I thought that being a Christian was being patriotic. And I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm patriotic, you know, I'm, I'm a Christian or whatever, but really having no idea. And so basically, you know, like I said, I just, I just honestly, I just, I, I was the person I was like, I loved, you know, you know, I'm not against secular music or anything, but like the music that I was into and I just loved and I was like basically worshiping, it was like music that was totally so blasphemous. I mean, like basically, you know, saying God, God was dead and just all this just crazy, crazy music. I was like in a really, really just dark time, did not care. I really had a lot of fear growing up about dying and like, you know, just all that kind of stuff and I had no peace and I was just running around doing everything in the world um, hanging out with all the wrong people like trying to fill this hole and meanwhile um, you know the person I was like you know I, I literally don't I cussed so much it was crazy like literally every other word I was not the same person that you guys know today just to tell you that much so <laughs> Basically, like I said, I was just really, really lost. I was really, really lost. And if anybody would have looked at me then, they would have never known or thought that I would have ended up the person I am today. And it's only because of Jesus. But, okay. So, basically, um, you know, like I said, living that lifestyle, just really just completely, like, living a lifestyle of sin and going, just honestly, like, busting hell wide open. Like, having just no clue and not having any, any regard or any love for God. So, basically... When I was 18 years old, um, I met my amazing hubby loves. Anyways, I met okay. him. So we moved in together, and uh, we were living together and everything, and totally just living like a crazy lifestyle as far as not living for God, um, getting into all kinds of stuff. But anyway, David really started like he really started like seeking God again and he he really he didn't really tell me um, much about it at first because he thought he was gonna freak me out because obviously I was like crazy and so um anyways <laughs> so he he would say little things to me he would be like he would be like you know listen to this listen to this music or, or check this out or whatever he would just like mention little things to me and I would be like okay okay and um and it's so slowly but surely it's like he started just talking about this this God that like I had no clue about that I thought I knew him and everything but it was like he talked about him like in such a way that I did not understand and I did not relate to in any way and so so you know after just you know weeks and weeks and weeks of him just talking to me and then um, I remember he brought me one night to this place called a uh, 12th hour cafe and um, it was a place where all these Christians met and did worship and just fellowshiped and stuff. And that's where I met Margie Doolittle, who has been an incra I mean, crazy, has been an incredible woman of God in my life. Um, I mean, from the time I was unsaved to, until now, she is such a role, role model to me and inspiration. But I had met her that day, and I remember her sitting there talking to me, and I had a whole bunch of questions about the Lord, and I, I was not saved. But I had questions about Him, and I was curious, and it's like God was pulling me. He was drawing me close to Him, and I really, I had no idea. I was like just being called to Him, and, and so I remember shortly, shortly after that, um, David had told the Lord, he told me later that he wanted to marry me, but he wanted, he knew that I would have, to, I wouldn't have to be saved before he would marry me. And so shortly after that, um, really funny circumstance, but we were laying in bed together and talking and I literally sensed such a strong fear of the Lord. Like I knew when we were talking about God and everything and talking about eternity that I was not going. I was not going to heaven. I did not know God like he described. I could not relate to it, but I knew in my heart that I wanted that. I knew that that this is what I wanted. I didn't understand it. I, I was totally like not, you know, a perfect person. I wasn't doing all the right things. I just knew I desired God. I wanted to know this God that he was talking about, which was Jesus. And so we lay there in bed, he held my hand, and he led me, um, we prayed together. He just told me to pray to God from my heart, and I prayed, and I repented of my life of sin, and just everything that I did, and all the ways that I cursed God, and just all, all that stuff. We prayed, and I repented, and I gave my life to Jesus, and I just said, Lord, come into my heart, cleanse me, reveal yourself to me, make me, you know, I want to be your child. 
And so we prayed that night, and I just felt such a, a strong presence of God. It was just incredible. I will never, never, ever forget that night. And so, anyways, um, the next day and, and just days after that, it was like immediately God started just revealing himself to me. He started speaking to me. He started showing me certain things in my life that... Um, you know, he wanted to speak to me about and, and, and bring me closer to him. And I just started getting so hungry, like, to know him and to read the word. And I started opening the Bible and reading it. It was, like, the most amazing love story ever. Like, when I had opened the Bible before, like, when I totally was not saved, it was like, what? What is this? I mean, I don't even know what this is. But then when I opened it, once he had opened my eyes, it was, like, the most incredible thing in the world. And so... It was so cool though because it was like my, my life was such a mess. I was such a just crazy person. When God saved me, I didn't have to change that when he saved me. He actually called me. He loved me. He died for me when I was in my sin and he saved me. And so when I came to him, I just gave him everything. And he, his strength and the Holy Spirit is the one that came in and changed me and did all the stuff that needed to be done. Took all the negative things out of me. He gave me a new heart. You know, talk about the, the Jessica heart. Before I was saved, I was crazy. I was like vicious. I was not, I was, it was not good. But God took that heart and gave me a new heart. And what's so cool is like I had a crazy wild personality before just like I do now. And God didn't, my personality is still the same. I'm still the same Jessica that I was then. But as far as my spirit and my heart, I, I died to that lifestyle and I was born again. And um, I was never, ever the same. It was just God. incredible. Like all the things God spoke to me and all the, all the desires that I had before, like cussing and just the thoughts I had and all that crazy stuff. God just completely just, just took it away from me. And it was so amazing because it wasn't like this like thing that was you know oh I got saved now I gotta be religious and I gotta do all these things it's like his the sweet spirit of Jesus just worked on every and little thing November of 2003 we got married and it was really awesome because on our honeymoon we went to Daytona Beach and we uh, knelt down on the beach together and we repented and we told the Lord we were sorry for living in sin and, and not serving him and 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 you know um, doing all those things before marriage and all that kind of stuff and we repented and we gave our life and our marriage to him and I'm telling you whew, the like things majorly majorly changed I mean it was incredible like on the way back from our honeymoon I remember we were like oh my gosh we were just talking about so much stuff like the dreams and visions that God was giving us and things he wanted to speak to us it was incredible oh I'm so exciting I can still remember it now but um and God has never stopped ever since my ever since I gave my life to him and um and I just gave it all to him it's like oh my gosh I've never ever 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 been the same and I, I want to tell you if any of you guys like I said, knew me before it, it would be amazing. Like, my testimony, my story, I just told you, doesn't even do justice of the person that I was and how God completely saved me. For You know, He died on the cross for me. He forgave me of all my sin. He washed me clean. He gave me a whole new start. Uh, being a believer and everything, I, like, you know, I just wanted, I wanted, like, just deeper, deeper um, times with God and, like, just understanding and uh, experiences with Him and everything. And I told David about it and everything. And I remember um, just praying about it and reading things in the Bible that I wasn't seeing happening in my life and in church and all those kinds of things. And so I started reading about being um, baptized in the Holy Spirit. I started praying about it and asking God to fill me with His Spirit and talking to David about it and everything. And uh, he really encouraged me, like, in the Word and in the Scriptures to um, just go for it. And um, one night I um, was praying and had people praying for me. I got baptized in the Spirit. And um, also, like, that was just so intense. I have so many, like, um, testimonies and stories and journals that are just filled with things that God has spoken to me and miracles He's done for us and um, just different things. Like, when I started um, learning to hear from Him and uh, and really start discerning His voice, it's like, I have just, just crazy, I mean, like, literally, I could probably fill up about... 200,000 hours, not really, but literally like 20,000 hours probably, maybe not that much, but anyways, a lot, like 
2,000 hours of video of things God has showed me and spoken to me and miracles and testimonies and healings and deliverances and, and, and the smallest things that just meant so much to me to the biggest things. So I just want, um, you know, and so, so sometimes maybe if I sit down and am able to talk um, with any of you guys, um, you know, we can talk about different things because I love to share things that God has done. I mean, it is incredible things that he did at the beginning till what he did for me a couple days ago or today yesterday and so um, I just want to encourage you like I just really want you to know that I was extremely 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 lost and had no idea and God because of his intense incredible love and passion for me he captivated my heart and he drew me near and he revealed his truth to me and um so if you're funny and and uh, he he when I gave my life to him and I repented he cleansed me and he made me a new person and um, I just want to encourage you any of you guys out there that have loved ones or just um, people you know that are not living for God and who are you know just seem like they're going way off the deep end or they're you know just just whatever may be going on have hope for them I promise you because like I said I only scratched the surface when it came to my testimony if you guys knew me it would be in disbelief that I knew the Lord and I stand for what I stand for now and I know him um, because it was totally God it was he is incredible um, he is everything to me he ever since um, ever since I gave my life to him it's like it's been incredible I mean like people really have no idea the ama the amazing love of Jesus is not about it's not about um religion or being perfect or or joining a church or doing certain Christian things it's about meeting Jesus knowing him revealing I mean him revealing himself to you and you receiving and saying yes to him and and what he has for you that is what's so incredible um, and like I said I really could talk forever about the subject because this is just it is my foundation of who I am. It is the reason I do what I do. It is my joy. It is my passion. It is my peace. It is Him. It's Jesus Christ. Be encouraged. Christ. Be strengthened today. Know that Jesus died for you. He loves you. He desires you. He wants to have a relationship with you. Um, and not it's not, not just a, a thing of... Um, religion and spiritualness and all those things he wants to have in every single day um, encounter with you speaking to you all throughout the day touching your heart ministering to you leading you being your best friend your king um, everything everything in the world he wants to be for you you gotta just let him so let it all go and uh, get to the point where you're ready to give just lay your life down at his feet and and ask for him to give you life and um, and I'm telling you you will never, ever, ever, ever be the same, and it will be a tremendous, incredible blessing both on this earth. Hi, my name is Joel Defoe. I'd like to take just a few minutes to tell you about how I came to accept Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. All my life, I've read my Bible, gone to church, and prayed to God. I've done these from an early age, and as far back as I can remember in my childhood, you see, I grew up in the home of a Baptist pastor, and these things were expected of me. I'm very grateful that my parents taught me and instilled the importance of these wonderful Christian habits in my life. I was a pretty good boy growing up, didn't get into too much trouble. Even after leaving home to attend college, I continued in my good Christian habits. My parents were proud of me, and I was glad that I was making right decisions and pleasing them and doing what they wanted and living a Christian life. I met my wife, we became married, and after finishing school, we moved to Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, began to attend the Lehigh Valley Baptist Church. While there, we became involved in the music ministry as well as the children's teaching ministry. But even though I was doing all of these good things for God, there was still something that was wrong in my heart. You see, up to this point, I had done all these good Christian things, these religious things, because that's what was expected of me. And I didn't want anybody to think that I wasn't a Christian. It was just what Christians do. And so I just did them rather thoughtlessly. But soon my thinking was going to be confronted by truth from the Word of God. In 1993, a special speaker came to our church, and he was preaching some special meetings in the evenings. One evening, he opened the book of Mark chapter 11 in the Bible and began to read the story of Jesus as he was walking with his disciples. Looked out and saw a tree 
As Jesus approached the tree, he expected to find fruit, but the Bible tells us that he found nothing but leaves. I began to contemplate this passage. For some reason, it stood out to me, and I couldn't get it out of my mind. I was bothered by the fact that this scripture really described my life. You see, Jesus had seen this tree from afar off that looked very good. It looked healthy. It had leaves. But as God came and took a closer look, he discovered that there was something seriously wrong with this. My life was much like that. I was living a good Christian life, doing all the things that Christians do. And to everyone around me, I think I looked like a good Christian. But I discovered that when God examines your heart, He sees what's there. I was bothered by that. There were things in my heart, in my life, I didn't want anybody to know about. There were things that I liked to do. There were thoughts that I had. There were even things that I'd done that I would be ashamed if anybody knew. But I thought I had everyone fooled into thinking that I was a good Christian. But now I began to ponder, what does God see when He looks at my life? The Bible says that the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looketh on the heart. I knew that God saw my heart. I knew that I had no ability to change the sin that was there. And I needed help. The Bible says, Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and have come short of the glory of God. Another verse that captured my attention was 1 John 1, verse 6, which says, If we say that we have fellowship with God and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. I had lived a lie. I had fooled others into believing that I was a good Christian, but I really didn't have a relationship with God. I really didn't even give these things much thought. Romans 5.8 says, That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And so it was on a Sunday evening in October of 1993, I bowed my head, confessed my sin to God. I asked Him to come into my heart, to change me, to save me from my sin, and to help me to live a life that would be pleasing to God and not just to people around me. Now you would think, growing up in a religious home, that there would be very little change, but I must tell you that the changes were significant. As I began to read my Bible after that night of accepting Christ as my Savior, The words came alive. It was as if God was speaking directly to me, something I had not experienced in the 20 plus years I had been reading my Bible. Prayer to God just seemed so real. It was like He was there. And now I know that I have a true relationship with the God of heaven. And today I encourage you, if you do not know Christ as your personal Savior, that you would... Alcohol was destroying my life, but Christ set me free. My name is Karen Fowler, and I'd like to tell you how I came to know Christ as my Lord and Savior. I wasn't raised in a religious family. My family never went to church, and by the time I was 14 or 15, I became involved in in alcohol, and it seemed only natural because everyone I knew drank. By the time I was 16, I was pregnant and married. And my, our lives revolved around alcohol and drugs and violence and infidelity followed shortly after. My husband's parents, they were professing Christians and they were the first ones who had ever told me of Christ and how he had died for my, for my sin. And one Sunday um, I visited a local Baptist church and must have been convicted through the message of something and walked the aisle, prayed a prayer, and left there believing that I was saved. After 16 years, my marriage ended in divorce, and I I turned to alcohol, trying to drown drown out the pain. Soon afterwards, I met a man at a bar, and we uh, began a long-distance relationship. Um, Soon after, my daughters and I, we moved in with uh, Scott and his two sons. The, um, it wasn't easy as I had thought it was going to be. There was bickering and fighting between the children and soon uh, created problems between myself and Scott. And once again, I turned to alcohol trying to deal with the 
problems in my life. And what began as something that was leisurely became as a daily dependence. And then one Saturday, um, a group of us, we went down to Celtic Fest and I had drank, began drinking early on in the day and drank on through the night and became so drunk that I had done something to really embarrass myself and everyone I was with began laughing thinking that it was funny but I was humiliated and I, I hated what I had become, a drunk. And I knew something had to change so I thought well, maybe going back to church would be the thing. So I began visiting Leo Valley Baptist Church and soon and after, uh, one of the ladies from the church asked me if I would be interested in doing a Bible study with her, and I quickly accepted. During the study, um, I began questioning my previous salvation profession, profession of salvation, asking that if, if I had truly been saved, why hadn't I ever changed? And because the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And she told me to go home and pray about it. So all week I, I was asking God to show me if I was truly saved or not. And by Sunday morning, I was really burdened. Um, about it and I just cried out to God and told him I needed to know today whether I'm truly saved. So that morning during the message pastor kept repeating over and over today is the day of salvation, today is the day of salvation and it was that moment I knew God had answered my prayers and it was that day December the 8th 2002 that I repented of my sin and placed my trust in Christ alone for my salvation. I didn't know where I stood before God, but God uh, settled that for me. Hi, my name is Ed Rice, and this is my story. Uh, as I grew up, I, um, I went to church um, when, my, when my family did. It's not something I really wanted to do, but of course, if the family went, I had to go. I would much rather be around, uh, you know, uh, doing whatever I wanted outside of going to church. But um, I always had my own beliefs, and I felt, you know, why does where does church fit in there you know as long as i believe what i want to believe and i believe that's right then isn't that good enough i mean after all the church always uh said as long as you uh believe uh, the things that we say are right you know then you're okay and that always you know made me feel good you know so why did i need to go to church but nevertheless i had to go to church so i grew up going to church um as i grew older though um i, I met some people that were um born again christians and they gave me some uh what we call uh tracks or little pieces of literature talking about the Bible and uh, I, know, I remember reading one of them and it, it said in there everything that I believed so I I felt good about that you know because it's well I believe this stuff so I must be all right but then at the at the end it said uh, about uh, saying a certain prayer to uh, repent of your sins and trust in God for salvation it's like well why do I need that because I already believe everything they say so I must be in the in the place where they are which is saved um, but there was a question that someone posed to me once that I could never shake and that was if you died today would you be in heaven or hell and I didn't have an answer for that and uh, so I, I thought about that sometimes over the years and, and in my best uh, logic if you will I would say um, well the best I could come up with anyway is um, that well the, when I die there's no heaven or there's no hell we just go to the grave and we die because if you dig up a body you see it's not there anymore so there is nothing after after life and, and then of course then there's nothing to to be judged for or pay for you know after after death as I became an adult I, I joined the Pennsylvania Army National Guard and I met two uh, men there that were born-again Christians and they would talk with me a lot about sin and what the Bible says is sin and they gave me some more things to read and um, these are things again from the Bible and uh, I always tr um, try to uh, through my own logic if you will uh, say that the what they're saying I'm guilty of is, is not a, a sin in my case you know it's it's not what they're saying it is and 
and they're just merely taking the the Bible to uh, interpreting it to mean what they want it to mean. But um, a, a, as reading the Bible, the through the, the through the Holy Spirit of God, He would put conviction on my heart, and I would not find peace. But um, and then one day at work, I was talking with a, a man and. Uh, he uh, was arguing with me about something being sin or, or not. And of course, on my end, it, well, no, it's not sin. But um, on my way home, driving home from work, I thought, well, you know, maybe this isn't sin or, or it is. I, I thought it wasn't, of course. But, uh, well, there certainly is some time in my life that, that, I, that I did sin. And that understanding, again, only came from the Holy Spirit of God's conviction in my heart. And when I realized that, I saw myself apart from God, and literally I could not, I was, I was so burdened I, and not having any peace because I could not find a way to get to God. And uh, anything I did in my life, good or bad, it didn't matter at this point. I have sinned. I chose to do wrong against God. But then a few seconds later, I, I remembered, of course, from reading the Bible, that uh, that even though we are guilty of sin and the payment for sin is death and hell, that Christ, the sinless, the one who's never sinned, died on the cross to pay for that sin, his shed blood covering our sins. And at that point, I accepted that lifeline, and for the first time in my life, all that burden about sin was gone, and I had God's peace. What reached me for Christ, what reached me for the gospel, it was one solitary high school boy who refused to take no for an answer. In the Western culture, in the Western civilization, Christians basically hit one shot and done. You tell somebody about Jesus, if they reject you, bye. You have to understand in our world, for a Muslim to come to faith in Jesus Christ, to leave Islam, you lose your culture, family, job, home, sometimes your life. And the average Muslim, it takes seven years to come to faith in Jesus. For me, it was, it was any number of years. But one boy, from the moment he started talking to me, would not leave me alone. It didn't matter how many times I said no. I, 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 he invited me to events. He invited me to uh, special all-night things. He, he invited me to concerts. I said no, 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 no. I did not want contact with the uh, kafurim, with the infidel. Finally, my senior year in high school, to show him, I walked into this little church. So one solitary boy, one tiny little storefront church, one pastor who had maybe a sixth grade elementary school education. It was always the small, the isolated, the anonymous. And if you think about it, Christianity marches on the shoulders of anonymous people who have invested their lives, I mean, any person watching, if you do a, a, a detailed analysis of your life, most of the people who radically affected you were people who the world doesn't know their names. Their names aren't on the spines of books or on the sides of buildings. They're, they're the anonymous. And it was an anonymous boy. It was an anonymous church. It was an anonymous pastor. And it was one little people who loved me to the cross. And it, this is important because everything I had ever learned about Christianity, I had learned from my imam, from my uh, masjid, from my mosque, from my leadership. Every single one of them. And, and, and every caricature that I held was based on caricatures that other people had held. The meaner I was to them, or the more sarcastic I was, or caustic I was, the nicer they were to me. I sat by myself, boom, they all come sit around me. Uh, I'm churlish, and they just smile. I was amazed at the ability of the Christian to love me in spite of me. And this is important because it's unconditional. And when I finally afterwards asked them, why are you so nice to him? Why were you so... Well, I said, that's the way Jesus loved us. Romans 5.8, for God commanded his love toward us, but while we were still sinners, while we were still at war with him, while we still hated him, Christ died for us, the godly for the ungodly. That is a, a radical concept for somebody like me. He takes me to the pastor, the young man does, and the pastor says, what do you think about Jesus? And I said, Anissa, 
His name is Isa in Islam. We respect Isa. As a matter of fact, we named the 19th uh, surah of the Quran after his mother, Surah Miriam. He said, you can't respect Jesus. It's something that I tell Muslims when they say, no, we hold him in high reverence and high respect. You cannot respect Jesus. Because Jesus declared himself to be God. Isa ab Messiah. Jesus said he was Messiah. And more than just Messiah to the Jew, but he came to die for the world. If Jesus said these things, he is not qualified to be a prophet in Islam. The people who claim to be God, and there's thousands of them throughout history that have claimed to be God, they are either diluted, or in the case of Jesus, he actually is who he says he is. But in either case, some man walking down the streets drinking alcohol, who's talking to himself, who thinks he's God, does not deserve my respect. To summarize it, he said, you either revere him as God or reject him as a fraud, but you don't have the option of just respecting him. When that door opened, he asked me this question. He said, Islam teaches that Jesus wasn't crucified. Yes, Surah 4, verse 157, Esau was not crucified, but somebody else in his place. He said, why would Jesus be indicted of a crime worthy of crucifixion to begin with? Was it trumped up charges? No. Was it blasphemy? Yes. What's blasphemy? In other words, he opened the door to me about crucifixion. That when Jesus died, his death had some meaning, some hope. In every debate that I've done, in every time I've debated Muslim, Sunni, Sufi, Alawite, uh, Shia, every debate I've ever done, this question always comes up from the Muslim. What does one man's death have to do with me? But you see, in Islam, there is a measure of this. If I die to further Islam, I am helping my children, I am helping um, my family, I am helping future generations. So my death does, in fact, resonate throughout Islam. The question I asked him is, what would Jesus' death resonate for you? In other words, if Jesus shed his blood, I don't have to. Jesus' blood shed, Jesus' death offers me the one thing that Islam cannot answer, and that is the screaming need for my assurance, the screaming need for forgiveness. And so Jesus Christ, according to the Bible, dies on the cross, buried three days, resurrects, ascends into heaven's temple, presents his blood, and then he sits down. And so then I will ask the Muslim, why would, why would, Isa, why would Jesus sit down? Is he tired? And he sat down because he was done. Finished. Atonement has been offered. If I may say it this way, Jesus strapped himself to a cross so that I wouldn't have to strap a bomb to myself. I lasted four days in that church. After so many years of struggling, I lasted four days. On the fourth day, I came forward. Um, I told the pastor, Isa bin Allah, Jesus is the Son of God. I want to be saved. I want to be born again. And that's all preacher talk for simply saying that I wanted Jesus to forgive me of my sins. I accepted his sacrifice in my life. I accepted his bloodshed for me. I repented of my sin, turned my life over to him. He is not just a messenger. He is Messiah. And he's not just uh, the lover of my soul. He is now the Lord of my life. And in so doing, I learned that I live much more righteously when I'm not trying to earn his favor. I do so because I've already been receiving his favor. I do so because I love him like a child to his father. I do things to love him, not to earn his love. Up until the moment I became Christian, Everything I did was based on fear of the scale. Discovering that Jesus Christ forgiving me, cleansing me, saving me, had done this for me, I'm now confused. So do I not do good works? Often Muslims will point to hypocrites. And I, and I tell Christians, I say, you know, the worst Christian they know is the best Christian they understand. Because they always see the hypocrites. And I said, does that mean that I can go do what I want? That I can go live the way I want? Because now I don't have to earn his favor? And it's the exact opposite. I slowly had to learn 
that I do what I do and I am what I am and I read what I read say what I say not to be accepted but because I am accepted this change in my life diet this change of life I pray more now than I did before I was a Muslim when I was a Muslim because I don't have to pray God tells me I have access to the throne at any moment uh, it was said of, of one evangelist that he was not long without prayer but not long in prayer I don't have to go on for hours to prove something I pray when I have a need I pray that moment I pray that second I don't have to do wudu I don't have to do cleansing I don't have to put myself in a certain position or else he won't hear me he hears he loves and because God is so intimate the call for me to live a right life is now the love that a child has for his father I want his acceptance I know I have his love let me let me if I may add one little point here what is interesting is the liberation for so many Muslims who come to faith in Jesus leave Islam become a Christian is that we don't know how to respond to unconditional love that way we cry easily we are so free to love him back one of the things that, that catches my attention in Christianity is the idea of loving God unconditionally and without fear um, they call it worship it's devotion it's it's passionate it's driven this is foreign concept to us because when we speak of Allah in every debate in every discussion I have never met one Muslim not one who believes that the Allah of the Quran and Jehovah intimate Adonai God of the Bible are the same God Allah is not father the Quran Surah 112 the most important chapter of Quran says that Allah does not beget nor is he begotten Allah does not have children uh, to use the big terminology that people use Allah is transcendent that is he is judge he's creator he's on the throne he's watching he's separate but Christianity teaches more than just that the Bible presents that Jesus God the Father God the Son God the Holy Spirit are not just judge and creator but intimate indwelling there is no such thing for a Muslim to have a personal intimate uh, indwelt relationship with Allah I found out that when I got saved that we come boldly before the throne of grace to obtain mercy in a time of need no you're not the Bible says that you're a temple of the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit indwells you that I am inhabited by God in that he comes and lives in my life this is profound to someone who has never heard this we did things in Islam for the first almost 20 years of my life we did things out of fear out of obedience and when you pray you pray because Allah will do what Allah will do but you ask out of obedience as a Christian I ask because he is father it's one of those degrees of separation that separate Christianity from any other world religion we're not religious we're saved but that's more than just a little bumper sticker Christianity offers a relationship with the Creator as father no other world system has an intimacy with Creator as as the father and child intimacy in Christianity and only in Christianity does God offer the sacrifice for man around the world people throw virgins in volcanoes we we sacrifice blood on rocks uh, because we are trying to appease the wrath of God but Jesus on the cross took the wrath of God against sin hello my name is Michelle Kastner and I would like to take a few minutes to share something very important with you I'd like to share with you as a young girl I was sincerely religious but as I got older I realized that I was sincerely wrong as a young girl I went to church and loved everything about church and throughout my childhood years I made several decisions and prayed several prayers asking the Lord to save me but a lot of these prayers and these decisions were made because I was very fearful I was very fearful of going to hell and I was very fearful of how others thought about me I spent a lot of my time pleasing others and looking for their approbation in my life instead of really 
uh, searching my own heart and life. As I got older and the Lord began to work with me and, and deal with me through His Word, I began to understand that there was more of a spiritual struggle going on in my heart and life, and it became harder and harder to be good. There were a lot of times that I wanted the approbation of other people, and every time I would feel bad about myself or think that maybe they felt bad about me, I would just do some more good things um, so that they would see me as I really wanted them to see me, and I would also feel better about myself. After several years went by and I got older, I was able to be married, married a wonderful husband, have wonderful children, and the Lord, in His mercy, allowed us to go to the mission field. The first year that we were on the mission field was a very busy time, and it was very easy to get caught up in, in many of the different activities that were going on. But a very good friend of mine wrote me a letter, and she shared with me her testimony of salvation. She also came from a background a lot like my own, and she shared with me how the Lord had really shown her that even though she thought as a young child she was saved, she really wasn't. And she began to list some of the reasons why. And the Lord really used that in my heart and life. First of all, it scared me. I read the letter once and threw it away. But that was the turning point where the Lord really began to deal with me about what I was really like on the inside. Not what I was like on the outside, but what were the things that really motivated me and really uh, the sins and the difficulties and the troubles that I had from within. In the next few years, the Lord really began to show me different uh, character flaws and personality problems and just sin that was in my life that I had really never seen before. And as the Lord began to show me these things, they would trouble me. And again, that um, habit of trying to do better or trying to do more or trying to do uh, good things to make myself feel better would kick in and it was very easy to do on the mission field as a missionary's wife because those were the things that were expected of me. We were able to come home for our first furlough and the Lord continued to work in my heart and life just showing me different things that I was struggling with and really not getting any victory over and the Lord allowed me to listen to some very good sermons and I began to understand a word that as a young child in my church may have been preached, but I really never understood what the word repentance was. I never understood that repentance mean, meant just coming to the end of yourself, hating yourself, and seeing yourself as God sees you, not as the way you want to see yourself, but the way He really sees you. And that is what the Lord really started to deal with me, was beginning, was helping me to see how He sees me, and not how I would like to see myself. To make a long story short, at the end of that furlough, furlough time, we were in a missions conference and a message was being preached about living for the Lord and what we needed to have in our lives to be able to live for the Lord. The Lord just broke my heart and He showed me that I really could not go on continuing uh, to live this life of um, trying to please others and, and trying to make myself, be myself feel better. He showed me that I really needed to do business with Him, that I really needed to see myself the way He saw me. He broke my heart and really helped me to understand that I just needed to repent, that I needed to stop being who I was and allow Him to work in my heart and life and to become a new creature, a, a new creature in Him, to allow Him to guide my life and my thoughts and my actions and my words and that He would be all that I needed to worry about pleasing and not other people. The Lord was merciful to me and allowed me to hear a message of salvation again and again. And I can say that October 4th, 1996, the Lord gloriously saved me. He helped me to understand my need of Him and how much repentance is important in our lives. That religion is not just adding God to your life, but it's allowing God to become your life. And I thank Him and I praise Him for the opportunity that He gave me to listen again to another gospel message and to have the opportunity to become a child of His. Not every day is perfect, but I do see big changes in my life, um, and I'm so thankful to the Lord for all that He's done. Hi. Um, all my life,
life I had been told that Jesus died for the sins of the world, but I had terrible guilt over my sins. Um, I tried therapy and self-help and setting goals and trying to achieve the goals and even exercise to fill that emptiness that I felt in my heart. Um, I met my husband, got married, and I thought love will fill that void in my heart. Um, I got my doctorate and I thought, you know, achievement will fill that void in my heart. But all of those things just left me feeling empty and wondering, is this all there is? Is this all there is to life? My name is Michelle Zarillo and this is my story. Uh, shortly after my husband and I got married, we moved here to Pennsylvania and we began a Bible study with two men from Lehigh Valley Baptist Church. And as we did the study, I had some issues with some of the things that the Bible was saying. One of the things the Bible said was that I was a sinner and that I had sinned against God. I really felt this went against what I believed and I didn't think it was good for my self-esteem. The other thing was that it said that I was not a Christian because I didn't have a relationship with God. And my thought was that I had always been a Christian. I was baptized as a baby. I went to church, I prayed, I read my Bible, and to think that I wasn't a Christian um, really made me feel sad. And at the conclusion of the study, I prayed a prayer because I really was sorry. I was very sorry that I wasn't a Christian. I was very sorry that I was a sinner, but I was sorry in a disappointed in myself sort of a way that I had not achieved this goal, not a sorry that I had wronged God sort of a way. Um, and based on this prayer, I began my Christian walk. Um, as I learned more and more about what the Bible said, and I started trying to apply it to my life, I started realizing that I was falling shorter and shorter. I started getting angrier and angrier at the fact that I wasn't even able to be a Christian. I couldn't fake it, which is what I was, that was kind of my thought. I would act like a Christian until I grew into one, was kind of my thought. One night in June of 1994, a uh, visiting pastor came to our church and he preached a message on hypocrisy and it really spoke to my heart because I knew that what I was was a hypocrite before God. I was trying to be a Christian but I didn't have that relationship with God and um, the dots finally connected. I finally realized that it was me that had wronged God. It was me that had sinned and that Christ this, what I had been told my whole life, that Christ died for the sins of the world, applied to me personally. At the end of the service, they had an invitation, and I went forward to pray. And I knew, and I prayed, and I told God that I had wronged Him, that I was the one that was wrong, that from that point on, what He said, it was His way, not my way anymore. And I, it was my fault that Christ had to be crucified. Um, at, the end of this, at the end of the invitation, I went back to my seat, and it was the first time in my life I ever felt clean. I ever felt right with God. And um, the Bible says that He satisfies the longing soul, that He fills the hungry soul with goodness. And I can truly say that since that day that I was saved, that's, God has made that void complete. Thank you for listening to my story.